publish a 30,000 word ebook. <laughs> and so one thing led to another. Um, we, my agent uh, sent it out a, a proposal for a very brief book to, to many publishers in America who were universally uninterested in this subject, <laughs> mainly because this story has been told a hundred times before. Um, it's of no interest. We have some fantastically Baroque turndowns, including a 4,000 word <laughs> turndown in French <laughs> from a, a professor at the Sorbonne. That's kind of an inside joke. It was, it was uh, written at the instigation of a fairly well-known publisher just across the river who really doesn't like me. But in any case, <laughs> um, as, as John Milton instructed us, there is one just man in the universe. And uh, he is a, uh, a man roughly my age, uh, an editor at uh, Doubleday Random House Pantheon. I can't keep any of them straight. A guy named uh, Jerry Howard wanted to, to sign up this book. He wanted to publish it. He offered me a little money. And um, when I first met him, I went to New York to meet him. He was sitting at a table reading this, which is Nabokov's 930-page <laughs> commentary on Eugene and Yegan, and his exact quote was, I'm swatting up on the prosody. And I'm thinking, like, holy cow. And I looked him in the eye, and I said, I'm not going to mention the word prosody in any book I write for you. And things, things went downhill from there. <laughs> I, I'm kind of joking. Um, <laughs> but, but there's very little mention of prosody in this book, I can assure you. Although Nabokov was, uh, and Wilson both, wrote each other endlessly about prosody. In any event, um, we, did, we did the book, you know, took roughly a year um, to get the book done. The book was ready to be published in Thanksgiving of 2015, so I've completely forgotten the entire contents of the book, although I'm capable of reading from it, so that should be <laughs> um, this evening. Um, Jerry's kind of well known in his field, but, but I don't I don't need to sort of uh, pump his tires, as they say at the Boston Bruins. But um, he did he didn't edit much. It's, it it wasn't a book that required a lot of editing. It's the book we wanted. It's it's very smart. It's funny. It's it's not disrespectful in any way. Um, it's it's a lively read. His his two major contributions were the uh, the epigraph, which is a a terrific quote from Samuel Johnson. I mean, why wouldn't you start a book with a quote from Samuel Johnson? And his big editorial intervention, deep, sort of late in the uh, manuscript phase of the book, was he asked why we don't have any um, butterfly genitalia in this book. <laughs> and um, I realized it was sort of disgraceful that we didn't have any butterfly genitalia in this book, and so I hastily added butterfly genitalia. Um, you, you probably get the reference, uh, you know, Nabokov's famous collection of butterfly genitalia is also just across the river. Um, he did uh, part-time uh, zoological research, mainly obviously uh, involving butterflies um, at the, at the I think it's the Peabody Museum. I don't want to misidentify it. Um, it's but, MCZ. Excuse MCZ. me? MCZ, the Museum of Comparative Zoology. Excuse me, the Museum of Comparative uh, Zoology. And that's where the, butter <laughs> that's where the butterfly <laughs> genitalia are. Um, okay. So, that's my rant. Happy to answer any questions later. The three passages I want to read, the first one is, is sort of the most obvious, which um, is about the legendary correspondence between the two men. The uh, Nabokov and Wilson wrote each other uh, these genuinely famous letters. Some people feel it's the greatest literary correspondence of the 20th century. It was collected twice, once by a, a trade publisher after their death and collected a second time by the University of California Press. It's, um, it's extremely beautiful. In fact, it's been made in, this is a ridiculous plug, it's been made into a play called uh, Dear Bunny, Dear Valodia. Dear Bunny was um, Nabokov's salutation whenever he wrote a letter to Edmund Wilson. He was started Dear Bunny because <laughs> Bunny was the nickname that uh, Wilson's mother had given him when he was a little boy, a nickname he hated all his life. <laughs> and he was quite well known. And people did call him Bunny and he hated it. Um, Dear Bunny, Dear Valoidy is actually a two-person play, kind of like Love Letters, like the, uh, the Gurney play. And uh, we're going to perform it um, Thursday at the Boston Athenaeum. Um, if, if you have a truly insatiable interest <laughs> in... Uh, I'll be there. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, in, in the walk and Wilson. Anyway, here's a little bit of a flavor of um, why people like their 
their correspondence so much. This is, I'm, this is me. For the first several years of their exchanges, the two men could cheerfully disagree, for instance, on the correct pronunciation of nihilist. Nabokov pronounced the word nihilist. Wilson, nihilist. I also saw just recently that in Russian it's properly pronounced nihilist, which doesn't come up here. So, dear Valodya, nihilist is pronounced the way I pronounce it, Wilson writes, not nihilist, see any dictionary. They also exchanged letters on the question of lovemaking in taxi cabs. Can it be done? And if so, how? Wilson had been reading one of Nabokov's Russian novels, Mary, in the original, and noticed that the protagonists, quote, are supposed to have had their first trant or embrace on the floor of a taxi cab. I don't think you can have had any actual experience of this kind, or you would know that it's not done that way. <laughs> My dear bunny, Nabokov promptly <laughs> replied, it could be done, and in fact was done, in Berlin taxi cabs, models 1920. I remember having interviewed numerous Russian taxi drivers, fine white Russians, all of them, and they all said, yes, that was the correct way. I'm afraid I'm quite ignorant of the American technique. <laughs> In their serious exchanges about literature, Nabokov's wildly heterodox tastes and eccentric judgments quickly established themselves. themselves. Dostoevsky was, quote, a third-rate writer, and his fame is incomprehensible. Nabokov called Henry James, quote, that pale porpoise, and viewed him as a warmed-over Turgenev Monquet. T.S. Eliot and Thomas Mann were, quote, fakes, unquote. And when Wilson suggested that his friend include a Jane Austen novel in his Cornell survey course on European history, excuse me, European literature, the walk off bridled, quote, I dislike Jane Austen, he told Wilson. In fact, I'm prejudiced against all women writers. Nabokov reviled Freud, whom he called the Viennese quack or the Viennese wizard, and he would later include Freud in a personal rogues gallery of four doctors to be avoided at all costs, the other three being Zhivago. <laughs> well, if you laugh at that, there's a lot more, there's a lot more coming. Zhivago, the protagonist of the Boris Pasternak novel, I see Pasternak's name is misspelled here, the Boris Pasternak novel that Nabokov hated, the international humanitarian Dr. Albert Schweitzer, about whom even Wilson had his own reservations, quote, can't help feeling that there's something phony somewhere. <laughs> the fourth doctor, whom, uh, whom Nabokov despised, was Fidel Castro, who had received an honorary doctorate from Moscow University. Um, now, I, I mean, I'm just going to take a tiny, a tiny risk now, because I'm going to, I'm going to go down the rabbit hole that 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 this book kind of goes down in a complicated way, um, which is down the rabbit hole of Nabokov's kind of insane and yet brilliantly alluring and uh, crazy uh, 900 pages of analysis devoted to what's actually a very, very short poem, Eugene and Yegin. And um, I, I, I could read from the poem, I'm not going to bother doing that, but what you need to know is that in the first canto, or the first, yeah, first canto, um, this is very typical. Uh, Pushkin interrupts the poem and, and writes two sort of verses about women's feet and how great women's feet are and how he would like to be the waves licking the women's feet on the edge of the Black Sea. And uh, Nabokov devotes 15 pages of analysis to these few lines about women's feet which Nabokov calls the pedal digression. And, uh, in any case, I sort of go a little bit nuts with the pedal digression, as you will see, and I get involved with my own ridiculous digressions. So either tune out completely or please pay attention. Um, because this gets, this gets fairly crazy fairly quickly. A favorite moment in the poem, although it's a long moment indeed, quote, the pedal digression, Nabokov's name, for 40 lines of Onegin. I'm not going to read them. They end, how much I long, longed then with the waves to touch the dear feet with my lips. What takes Pushkin 140 iams, and iam has only two stresses, one stress, two feet, to express 
<laughs> takes Nabokov 15 pages of dense analysis. Quote, the pedal digression, Nabokov writes, quote, is one of the wonders of the work. Neither Ovid, nor Brantome, nor Casanova has put much grace or originality into his favorite comment, into his favorable comment on women's feet. Nabokov quickly dismissed the banal suggestion that Pushkin may have been a foot fetishist or ankle or calf. Now here's my first my first footnote in the pedal in my own pedal digression. Know, there's, there's a couple of Russian speakers here, and even the first year Russian speaker knows uh, complicatedly that the word for the end of your foot, which Pushkin is clearly uh, eulogizing, is the same as the word for your leg. Just as in first year Russian, you know, the word for your hand is the same as the word for your arm. So before I get into whether or not Pushkin was a foot fetishist, and Nabokov has his own views on that. I, I open up a, a, a ridiculous footnote about Douglas Hofstadter, the um, author of a book many people, not me, but many people probably mm. read called um, Gödel Escher Bach. He's a cybernetics professor at the University of Indiana who developed um, also an insane fixation on Eugene Onegin, spent two years <coughs> translating Eugene Onegin um, really badly. <laughs> um, but he developed this idée fixe. So Hofstadter correctly notes the Russian word naga and its diminutive, diminutive nashki, quote, is a notorious Russian word that means both foot and leg. Therefore, in his sensual pay to sleek pairs of feminine appendages, this is Hofstadter Pushkin, is referring just as plausibly to legs as to feet. I present Pushkin, quote, as a leg man rather than a foot fetishist. <laughs> That's Hofstadter. Then I go on and say Hofstadter is probably wrong about Pushkin being a leg man. Witness the testimony of the 19-year-old beauty, Anna Cairn, one of the poet's great loves, quote, among the poet's singularities was that of having a passion for small feet, which he, in one of his poems, he confessed preferring to beauty itself. Now we take up Nabokov again. The passion for a pretty instep that Pushkin shared with Goethe would have been called foot fetishism by a modern stu student of the psychology of sex a remark he doesn't bother to dignify with further explanation. This is how he's lashing out at, at Freud and the, con, and the concept of a foot fetish. Mm -hmm. To hell with the Viennese quack and his epigones while we're at it. To hell with those idiot translators he's been telling us about. And then, then he goes on to, to condemn every other translator other than himself. <laughs> but here, I have another footnote in my pedal digression. Another, another well-known man of letters shared Goethe and Pushkin's appreciation of the well-turned ankle, colon, Edmund Wilson. Quote, like Alexander Pushkin, the Russian poet whom he so admired, he was susceptible to the charms of women's feet. Wilson's son, Ruhl, re recalled in his 1972 memoir. This goes on and on. <laughs> Ruhl's half-sister noted that <laughs> their father himself had small feet. And upon meeting his soon-to-be fourth wife, Elena Thornton, he noticed, quote, that she had prettier hands and feet than Mary McCarthy. Yeah. <laughs> Kissing Elena's feet, Wilson wrote in his journal, quote, was erotically stimulating to me, and I would put my hand around her foot under the instep and squeeze it with an erotic pulsation. But I'm not done by any means. <laughs> <laughs> Reviewing, <coughs> I tripped across this in Florida, of all things. Reviewing Edmund Wilson's <laughs> journal collection, the 30s, for the New York Review of Books, Gora Vidal counted 24 references to women's feet. <laughs> Alluding to Wilson's podophilia, Vidal wrote, quote, he could have made a fortune in women's footwear. <laughs> in any case. But I'm still not done, because um, Nabokov then devotes several pages to trying to figure out whose feet, whose feet is um, Pushkin writing about. And I'll try to sort of skip around here. The heart of Nabokov's divagation is a whodunit. Whose footprints are these, he asks, flitting so gracefully across Onegin's pages. It's an interesting question because Pushkin had many, many lady friends, at least two of whom left memoirs of gambling with the mutton-chopped young poet exile at the seashore. The prime suspect is the beautiful Maria Raevskaya, one of four children of General Nikolai Raevsky, a hero of the Napoleonic Wars. Pushkin knew the family intimately and, of course, admired the general's attractive young daughters. I'm going to skip some more. Da, 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 da. <laughs> Nabokov thinks Pushkin alluded to his infatuation with Ekaterina in some lines from a, a portion of the poem that was never published. Quote, the glass shoe does not fit Maria Raevsky's foot, Nabokov concluded after several pages of textual scholarship. Quote, it may fit Ekaterina's, but that's a mere guess based on our knowledge of Pushkin's infatuation with her. Nabokov dismisses with a hand wave a Soviet-era seminar, quote, 
heroically meeting amidst the gloom and famine of Lenin's reign, unquote, that suggests that Pushkin may have dallied in the surf with the Ryevsky girl's chaperone. Then he advanced to his strongest candidate, Countess Elizaveta Varansova. I'm going to keep skipping. Oh, well, actually, I won't, because that's actually quite a, kind of interesting. Um, Varansova was a lover of Alexander Ryevsky, one of the Pushkin's closest friends and the brother of the gorgeous sisters. Alexander didn't mind Alexander Pushkin spending time with his mistress because their relationship through her husband, the governor general of the southern province of Novorossiya, off the scent. There's an 1834 letter from Pushkin's friend to her husband describing some tripartite Odessa wave dodging with Pushkin and Varansova. Later that year, da 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 da. Whose feet are these? He thinks he knows, colon. If the pair of feet chanted in 34 does belong to any particular person, one foot should be assigned to Ekaterina Raevska and the other to Elizaveta Varansov, Nabokov solomonically concludes. Then, after 15 pages, he objects to the whole process of analysis. He says, I'm very much against stressing the human interest angle in the discussion of literary works. The entire pedal digression, he concludes, quote, is of no interest whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> and I think you can agree. <laughs> um, I'm actually just going to end um, with, with a very brief, uh, I, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, it's, it's not a, it's not ever, uh, it is a book after all about, about a, a, a tragically curtailed friendship and, um, it's not, it's not meant to be, uh, sort of, um, caustic and, uh, and making fun of these people, uh, throughout their lives, nor is it. And I, I this is a, a kind of amazing flavor of, of the, the terrible feeling of regret um, when, when both men were no longer living. After Wilson died, Vera Nabokova wrote a letter to his widow, Elena, quote, I'd like to tell you how fond Vladimir has always been of Edmund, despite the unfortunate turn in their relations. We always think of Edmund in terms of past friendship and affection not of the so unnecessary hostilities of recent years. Two years later, when Elena Wilson was assembling the men's letters for publication, Vladimir Nabokov wrote to her, quote, I need not tell you what agony it was rereading the exchanges belonging to the early radiant era of our correspondence. That's it. Um, <laughs> anybody have any questions? Ooh. Brilliant. Brilliant. Okay, I'll fire off one. All right, you then you. <laughs> so much of the fight seems to have revolved around verb choice. <laughs> Can you name another feud where people got so excited about which is the proper, or for that matter, whether the verb is in fact existing? Right. Uh, no, to answer the actual question, no, but to fill in the context of your question, um, <coughs> there was this in really de demented exchange in the New York Review of Books that went on for years that often actually turned around the use of a, of a past participial gerund in Russian, <laughs> which Patruya, which is um, even for the Russian speakers in this room is very challenging to sort of decode, if you will. No, I don't know. And I don't know why they got it. I mean, <coughs> obviously, and uh, is this clear in the book? And I, I didn't make clear earlier uh, in their correspondence, uh, you know, th this was a, tri a trilingual correspondence. Um, Wilson and, and Nabokov were both fluent in French. They would sometimes refer to French. They're obviously, uh, Nabokov's English was hesitant in the early 1940s, became very strong very quickly. Um, and Wilson had studied Russian, didn't, didn't really know it all that well. Um, but in any case, they're, they're the immediate sort of the proximate cause for their breakup was uh, Wilson's sort of um, unhinged uh, accusations that uh, Nabokov had improperly translated the greatest poem in the Russian language, which um, which was probably not, it was just sort of the wrong battlefield <coughs> to tackle Nabokov on. Uh, James is next. Yes. What is the tragedy to this friendship? I mean, what, what were the qualities that both men to Can you repeat the question? Yeah, the, the question is, what's the tragedy uh, of the end of the friendship? I, I mean, <laughs> the tragedy is is the end of the of intimacy, right? I mean, how I there and 
maybe not the stuff of uh, book readings, but it's in the book. I mean, you know, friendship has an incredible value, actual friendship. And they knew when they were friends that they were in the middle of an actual friendship, you know, that permitted, permitted them to both love each other and be candid about each other's achievements. Um, I'm very hung up on elements in the correspondence where, uh, you know, uh, Wilson says, and I, and I promise you I'll return your socks. And I don't mean that as a joke, you know, it just seems like something that someone would say to someone that they felt intimately comfortable with, if you would. Um, so that, that was the loss, really. I mean, anybody, anybody who's, who's a writer or even a human being, you know, I think there's a, what, there's six, six people if you're lucky, you know, you can sort of trust with showing your soul. And I think uh, Wilson and Nabokov both felt that way. Uh, and that's why there was, that's why the, I mean, the, the explosion of hatred when they eventually fell out. I mean, the, I did, I, I guess I, I got a chuckle out of this, but I mean, Wilson literally uh, prepared a book to be published after his death that was an overview of Nabokov's novels and a very unflattering one that he had never published in his own lifetime. So he dies, and then this book called uh, Window on Russia, which is a pretty interesting little book, contains this, this kind of a tuperative attack on Nabokov, which Nabokov cannot, cannot answer. Yes? What was the tragic flaw in each person that allowed them to blow up something that they obviously valued? I mean, wouldn't it be vanity? I'm going to have to say it's vanity. I mean... The vanity of their vain. Pardon me? Well, yes, but and the book of became very vain. I mean, um, you know, I've I've had a few reviews. I have some more reviews, and reviewers seem to be interested in whose side am I on? Um, about which I really don't have much to say. But but Nabokov changed, you know, from being sort of a supplicant because in 1940. He's arrived in the United States. He has no money whatsoever. And Edmund Wilson helps him out in every sense, including financially, sets him up at the New Yorker. I mean, with a, with a, a, a real generosity of spirit that, that, that you're, cha you're challenged. I mean, we are challenged to show such generosity of spirit. Um, you know, base, I mean, it's simplistic, but you know, the publication of Lolita is, is a nuclear bomb uh, in world letters. It, it's probably the best-selling book of, of its era, it makes Nabokov instantly rich, he instantly leaves the United States, he sets himself up in Switzerland, he starts writing things like, you know, I'm a genius. In other words, it kind of, because he's rich and successful, right? And meanwhile, you know, Wilson is on what I would call a sort of conventional career arc, as he enters his 60s and 70s, he's drinking too much, he's failing, people aren't that interested in what he has to say about <coughs> literature, so, I mean, I, I view that disequilibrium is certainly uh, con contributing to the blow up. Yes? This question reminds me of one, but it's not my question. How did they beat? And my question to you is, were you a Russian speaker when you were bureau chief, and did you use source material in Russian? Your first question was, how did they meet? Yeah. Um, you know, it's all forgotten in the sands of time, but in the very late 1930s, there was a successful composer in the United States named Nicholas Nabokov. He did a lot of composing um, for the, the, the ballet in New York and for the Philharmonic. And he was a Russian emigre who was uh, Vladimir Nabokov's cousin. And he had a, rented a house in Wellfleet where um, uh, Edmund Wilson basically lived for much of his life and where he's buried. <laughs> and um, he got a letter when his cousin Vladimir was coming over, and he knew that Vladimir had nothing, and he, and he turned to his neighbor, Edmund Wilson, and he said, you know, and he, Wilson had been in the Soviet Union in 1935, so Nicholas knew that Wilson had an interest in Russia and Soviet stuff. And uh, Wilson, in a very sort of open and gracious manner, said, well, when your cousin gets here, have him get in touch with me, and that that that's, that explains that. Um, and this, the friendship really started then. Um, I mean, my Russian used to be really, really good. Um, 
I was an interpreter for a while, you know, so I'm, I'm familiar with the language. So the, the, the problem here was that um, Eugene and Yegan is a very challenging uh, work. I wasn't, I hadn't read it. I find Pushkin very, very difficult. So I, as I actually took a course. Um, I took the Harvard Junior Seminar a couple of years ago. They, they take the, the majors in their junior year and they devote a semester to one work. And by coincidence, it was, so I mean, I was in the classroom with like four Harvard juniors. And I came, I came back, for, it was a really terrific class. I came back once, I know you know my wife. And I said to my wife, I said, you know, um, my Russian's better than these Harvard juniors. <laughs> she looked at me and said, you idiot. You know, you've been speaking Russian for 25 years. Oh, yeah. <laughs> In case. But I had, to, I had to kind of get, I had to get the Inyegin stuff separately. I had to take that on board. Well, forget that. Were you reading any other Russian source material? For this? this? In Russian. Yeah, sure. Plenty. I mean, I mean some letters, obviously, in Russian. Some, some junk from the... Nabokov Museum in St. Petersburg, but I, yeah, it's, I don't know. There's been references to scholarship. But I have no idea what they're talking about. Yeah. I mean, did Wilson trigger some pride of Russian history and psyche in, in offended Nabokov? I mean, was that it? No, but um, I mean, the real third rail. I mean, I'm not. Your your question is is the church wrong pew. <laughs> the real third rail is that Nabokov's father was um, participated in the so-called February 1917 revolution and was, was a, a liberal. And Nabokov hated in Wellfleet in America, and he hated how Americans understood the word liberal. He felt that American liberals were, were kind of just sissified idiots. <laughs> And the, Feb the February Revolution was, um, and I'm willing to be corrected, uh, but it, it was a military revolution, okay? It wasn't a, a bloodless revolution. And Nabokov simply hated that American liberals, like Wilson, assumed that the Bolshevist outcome of November 1917 was the only possible scenario. It really pissed Nabokov off. And he felt, he felt his father died for that cause because his father was assassinated in Germany in the immigration a couple years later. So when Americans started prattling about Lenin, you know, and doing the right thing, and, you know, Stalin's just trying to get it together, I mean, Nabokov would go crazy. And in the correspondence, he often attacked Wilson on this one small point. He said, you simply have no idea. Um, of anything that, took, that transpired in Russia between basically, well, in the early 20th century. So it's, that's the answer to your question. Yeah. Um, Edmund Wilson was a big deal when I was younger, but is he almost forgotten now when you go around and talk to people? And even when you propose the book, did editors say, everybody's forgotten Edmund Wilson? I think he's completely forgotten. Yeah. I mean, I. Not me. <laughs> I, I wanted to mention that uh, I'm sorry. The question is about Edmund Edmund Wilson. You know, is yeah. I think he's completely. I mean, I, I know you you you've read the read the book, and there's this weird kind of you know joke in the beginning because uh, I was at this uh, this Boston Public Library event, uh, and this uh, this guy was there. This really well one of the well-to-do supporters of the Boston Public Library, and I said I'm working on a book that involves Edmund Wilson, and he says, I wish you'd stop writing about those ants. And he, 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 right. I, wanted to, I wanted to sort of hold on. There were a couple of things I wanted to mention about the editor of this book. This guy, uh, I mean, yeah, Jerry Howard actually took me to visit uh, Wilson's gravestone in Wellfleet, which of all things has a, has a, a Hebrew inscription on it. Um, Wilson was a was a student of Hebrew. I mean, Wilson's accomplishments are are pretty darn impressive, frankly. But they're kind of not like I don't know what to compare them to. Um, I think there I think there's some maybe older writers at the New Yorker who sort of understand at least what Wilson stood for. Um, my mom, you know, was read a, she read a lot of Wilson's books. Read a lot of Wilson's books in our house. But I it, I feel like it would almost take. A long, long time. I know some of you know the, you know, know where Wilson fits in, but 
it's really hard to analogize, you know, uh, that, that kind of deep middle brow current. Uh, and I, when I use the word middle brow, I use it with some, some respect, you know, trying to educate people. Ben. Yeah, well, first I want to drop a footnote on you and say that <clears throat> making love in the back of the taxi was eminently possible in New York City. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I was a taxi driver. <laughs> Oh, really? <laughs> and another question. You know, you spent a year with these two guys, and I have read much of your book, not all of it, and it's a good sprightly, it's a good sprightly read. I like it. But, boy, are they distasteful human beings. And how did you manage to hold your nose in mm -hmm. here? Well, well, I know you made a promise to an editor, but really, was it hard? Neither one of these guys comes across as someone think that's the source of some of the questions about where's the tragedy here. They both deserve each other. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. <laughs> that's Henry Kissinger's famous quote about the Iran-Iraq war. You wish they could both lose. Um, I, yeah, you know, I actually didn't know the protagonists. I, I also realized, I mean, I've never written a book about a subject I knew anything about. Uh, and this is you know, yet another example. Um, <laughs> I, it's clear that I became I became sick of, of Nabokov. I really became <coughs> sick of him. Um, and Wilson, I just was harder to get a handle on. Um, is, is is there any living relation of Edmund Wilson's in this room? It's <laughs> <laughs> um, a serious question. Speak your truth. Uh, I mean, sort of off the record, <clears throat> you know. I would cons and I hope there is no. I would consider I, I would consider writing an article about, you know, the attitude of his of his children, his living children towards him. It's 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 horrifying. Who is their mother? <laughs> two two different mothers. Not uh, Mary McCarthy. Yes, yes, Mary McCarthy. Oh my and I, goodness. Really? Mary McCarthy's son is alive. Wow. Uh, he's a, he had a career as a professor of, of Polish and Slavic languages uh, in the Midwest. I corresponded with him. He kind of. You know, sort of got angry at me at some point. I have nothing but, but respect for him. I mean, and again, I, I, I I'm feel bad saying this, but I mean, a lot of people know uh, Edmund Wilson's daughter in Wellfleet. She's she's civically active, um, and it, it, it's 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 heartrending. I know I have so many friends in this room who have children, and if your children spoke about you the way the things I heard, it's just just terrifying. So. I did come to see a, uh, I mean, for in, uh, you know, there, there, there's a document in here uh, written by his wife that, you know, I didn't really unearth it. I just said no one else had any much use for it. But it's a really long memoir written by his wife, which starts with him passed out drunk in upstate New York at 8.30 a.m. after breakfast. You know, and that's his wife that he kind of got. Uh, so his last wife. Yeah, yeah, Elena. So, you know, yeah, he was Wilson. To be fair, I mean, you know, he's he's the subject of two major biographies. Um, he, you know, he and I, I actually detail his his. Uh, I would say, you know, selfless. Uh, behavior, you know, vis-a-vis -vis Scott Fitzgerald, his Princeton classmate. Um, after Fitzgerald died, uh, Wilson uh, basically wrote uh, The Great Breakup and didn't accept any royalties for it. Um, he edited books so that um, Scotty, the daughter, could go to school. Um, you know, he's was, he was generous to Hemingway, who was, who was no, no bowl of warm milk himself. So I don't know, I mean, he was, he was a complicated guy, but anyway, he's... Genuine. <laughs> oh, an actual Russian speaker. Uh oh.
you know, he was one of the richest men in Russia, left Russia when he was 20, started from zero, absolutely zero, taught, taught languages in, uh, you know, in Germany, went to France, left on the last boat because his wife was Jewish, fought anti-Semitism for all his life, you know, basically he was able to get out of France because of his wife. He was an incredible individual, absolute strength of power of mind. He said ugly things to some people, but you know, he could afford it. So I just wanted to say, do you have a favorite of Because he like saved us. You know, we came from Russia, we knew nothing, and this is guy who wrote perfectly in both languages and translated so we could study language, you know, English, basically, you know, having both of his books in front of us. It was incredible. So what what's your favorite of Nabok? I um, I, I really like uh, speak memory. I, I really like uh, Lalita. Um, I, 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 I sort of like Pale Fire. I don't. I mean, Jane is saying one thing. It's really very interesting that, that most Americans don't know because they don't need to know it. But um, his first ten novels basically were written in Europe in Russian, and later in life he he actually translated his own work after he became sort of rich and famous, and then they started selling. A lot of the novels that you've read in English were originally written in Russian 30 he or 40 years. He was forbidden in Russia. He, would, he could not find his book in Russia until the Soviet Union fell apart. Right. He wrote exclusively in the in the emigration, which was huge. Uh, three or four million Russians were living in Europe. And uh, that's an, a, an incredible chapter of his life. And Jania's, I mean, 